Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and if you play Dungeons & Dragons, and especially old-school Dungeons & Dragons, please hit the subscribe button and subscribe to the channel, and now we'll move on to the video. Okay, I'm Matt Finch, and I'm here with Jeff Reitz, um, who is one of the venerable old-schoolers that's been involved in the, uh, the old-school renaissance for a very, very long time. Uh, and Jeff, I'm going to do, I'm going to start this out in a way that I haven't started uh, anything out on the show before because it sort of fits in uh, with your blog and the and the, the types of stuff that you blog. Tell me about your blog and your campaign and how they interact. Okay, so Jeff's game blog started around 2003-2004. Prior to that I had been a pretty regular poster on rpg.net and I could just tell that my interests in gaming were sort of veering off from what the mainstream RPG net sort of folks were were really into and I was uh, more interested in sort of going back and looking at older editions of D&D at that point and thinking well what are other things that we could do with them that weren't necessarily supported by the commercial end uh, you know, what TSR and later Wizards of the Coast had done with it, what were the and, other and avenues that could be taken? Just to, jump in, just to jump in there for everybody, sure. that's a pretty good uh, description of what was happening in a lot of places on the Internet. That was um, uh, what was happening with Me Too around 2004. Lots and lots of gamers suddenly, I, I think because of the Internet, started coming together. So what was your, what was your interface with the Internet when that turned into a community? Yeah, um, so I had been very active in the late 90s on RPG Net and had discovered some of the alternate places for talking about role-playing games like Dragon's Foot, for example, was a place that I, I had hung out with. Uh, but for me, I, I felt like I just needed a place where I could think my own thoughts out aloud by myself and then later people started reading the blog. And that's that's where I felt like, on my end of things at least, the old school community started coming together as a series of people who were doing sort of long form with what they, with what they wanted to do with D&D &D and other older games and doing so in a way that here's a public record of it where you don't have to search through 45 threads on a, a forum somewhere. And let me just let you know that your your camera uh, is going to have a kind of a blurry picture when I um, uh, post this up because whatever's happening with the connection, you're going to be a little bit blurry, Jeff. Um, okay. So now your blog probably, um, you know, at the beginning behind um, Grognardia was probably is has probably been one of the most popular blogs up until uh, Tankar's Tavern sort of shot up. Uh, yeah, and I, a lot of the time, don't have a good explanation for it because I spend a lot of my time talking about exactly what is of interest to me and, you know, occasionally responding to what else is going on in, in on the scene. But I, I consider it a very sort of idiosyncratic and private space when I'm writing, but apparently a lot of people uh, respond to it well, and that's, that's nice, but... Uh, you know, when I first started, I had one good friend who read it occasionally, and that seemed like an adequate audience at the time. I think I just, you know, a lot of people like that idiosyncratic private space that you set up for yourself and like to look into it. Yeah, and so my uh, my current campaign sort of evolved out of out of that space. So I, I run a campaign via Google Hangout. And there's a, a space on Google Plus that's sort of a community location for posting of play reports and who's going to be in the next Hangout and stuff like that. But it really started as, hey, I could run a game for some of the people who read my blog. And that's how uh, my last two online campaigns have basically been done. I wrote sort of a end out like I do with nearly every campaign, but I posted them as public Google Docs and then shared the link on my blog. 
and then I created a uh, Google form where anybody who wanted to try playing could play at least once if you submitted on this form. Here's my name. Here's my Google Plus ID. Uh, and then uh, so I've had two campaigns now where basically the the public space for the kinds of things that a DM has to discuss with all their players is the blog, and then the play area is is Google Plus. And uh, I my first campaign we we went I think about thirty sessions with about fifty different players over the course of it. Uh, and what I thought was great is all around the world, uh, people I would never get a chance to play with otherwise. I think that's one of the great things about playing online. And my current campaign, we just finished session thirty one of it. And I've had about 35 different players. Now tell me about the, um, you wanted to get back, you said, to what you could do with the, uh, with the older original rules. And yes. so how has that, um, I mean, tell me a little bit about how that um, comes out in Google Hangout. What, is, what does that mean to you in terms of, uh, of the play style that you're yeah. using? So I tend to start from what do I think is the minimum amount of rules we can have on the table that we can all agree on. For me, that usually amounts to something like basic expert D&D from 1981, Mold Vane and Cook, or uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, I think, does a really good job of improving on those rules. Um, so something something that's for a lot of people's taste more simple than what they want in a normal can't game i mean there's lots of people who like very crunchy versions of dnd and i've played a bunch of those but for a for an online game you know it, i'm not interested in running highly tactical combat in that space which would They're, be uh you know that google is much better for uh, theater of the mind, whereas if you're doing more tactical stuff, it's going to be a virtual tabletop like Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds. Exactly. So so the approach is, is definitely much more uh, theater of the mind. Let's try to imagine the same events happening to the best degree possible, which of course requires in an online space a lot of taking time to restate the situation, sometimes having to repeat verbatim what you just said because of, you know, the uh, contingencies of playing in an online area and not being able to just quickly sketch out what you're talking about necessarily. I'm not real good with using graphics in online play, so I spend a lot of time talking through sort of the ramifications of, you know, things like does the door have a knob or a pull on it or stuff like that? Um, or exactly where is so-and-so when the fireball goes off? Yeah, I do, do you, um, I mean, when I'm playing, doing theater of the mind, which is pretty much what I do at convention games, not so much um, when I've got a small number of people, but um, in the convention games, I do have my own drawing of where, things are usually on a whiteboard showing their marching order, you know, one or two things like that mm -hmm. for specifically the fireball situation. Um, so, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that can be hard to keep track of, but I usually do it on the DM side. Um, with Google, I can't see, I mean, I, I really like theater of the mind because I think that when there are certain things that you can do when you're using either props or minis or even diagrams that, prevent the uh, the players from necessarily visualizing something that is as strong as what they would do if it were on their own. Yes, I agree with that. I think I have played a bunch of games with miniatures. They can be a lot of fun, but it's also very easy for the, the game to become about them or to become a distraction from that shared imaginative space, which is that shared imaginative space of space is important to me. I think it's the heart of playing D and D, at least the way I enjoy it. When it's working right, I think that's when the game is at its most fun for me. When it's clear in the moment that we're all on the same page in terms of 
imagining this event and what we can do within its confines, that's when the game's at its juiciest, but sometimes it's hard to get there. Well, even when it, um, even when it's hard to get there, I think that, um, even when, you know, say you've got four, four players around a table and they've got some general agreement on what they're seeing. But to me, it's not a problem if all four of them have slightly different details in mind, because mm -hmm. since, since they're visualizing it themselves, that's going to be a pretty powerful picture, even though, and no one's ever going to know that there were four different, you know, detailed views of it. Sure, that's sort of that's sort of the Rashomon approach to uh, to uh, uh, the shared imaginative space, and you know I want each of the players to leave the table ideally thinking they were the protagonist of that adventure. You know, yeah, all, all everybody leaves thinking that's the case. So uh, that means they're all going to imagine a slightly different adventure they were just on. Now let's go back to Rashomon. What did you mean by that? Okay, so, you know, the film Rashomon tells the same uh, uh, events from multiple points of view. And, and that's, a, that's a Kira Kurosawa, right? Right, yes. And uh, so uh, I, I use it in the classroom with, with my students, uh, even when we're something far afield from Japanese cinema. Uh, and uh, it's not clear from any of those points of view which one is the objective truth, or even if there is such a thing within the confines of that film as the objective truth. And I don't feel like we have to strive for that objective truth at the game table as long as each player can leave and the dungeon master can leave with a set of coherent events on their own that seem to make sense and that overlap enough an event happened that they could all participate in. That's the that's the first time I've heard that articulated in that way. Because I mean, my view of I don't care whether they've got different you know details. Um, I mean, sort of points in that direction, but it's not nearly um, as comprehensive a kind of view that each one of your players may perceive the events differently. I don't think that's ever even occurred to me that they would that they would view the the events of the adventure itself as to who's the hero I don't, that's never crossed mm -hmm. my mind that's a, a really neat thought yeah so this is a fairly new development in my thinking about dming and spurred in part from my experiences in online play i started doing this thing where as a way to pick up some extra experience points i would say okay after the session is over if you do a write-up for our uh google plus community as to what happened from your character's point of view you can pick up 100 xp times your current level i think is what what i'm what i'm offering and i got all these beautiful play reports that for the most part were accurate as to what happened but they were all told from the point of view of i'm the hero of this story that is that is absolutely awesome <laughs> that is absolutely awesome i'm gonna see whether i can get the players in uh in my online game to do something like that i'll probably use video um, for it but i bet it would be a hell of a lot of fun to have uh, each person's view cut it up so you've got one person's uh telling of an event right you know right following <laughs> another person's thing of an event and not go through the whole story but just do the different yeah. viewpoints that would be awesome i yeah yeah I'm i could so see that really that. working in in video kind of like uh when they do the confessional booth sequence in a reality TV show and everybody's <laughs> trying to make themselves look as good as possible, right? That's awesome. Yeah, or the or the cutaways in the office. My my campaign would yes. probably be a little bit more than the more like the cutaways on the office than it would be on uh, <laughs> on a reality TV show. So, um Let's swing over. Okay, so we've talked, we've, we've meandered a little bit into, um, into theory, and that's probably my fault because I like theory and tend mm -hmm. to push things that way. Um, talk about, um, for a second, stuff that you've written. Stuff that I've written? Okay, yeah. 
Sure. I mean, well, first of all, there's, you know, Jeff's game blog, which amounts to something like 3,500 posts at this point. Some of them are even good. Um, I self-published a small volume called uh, Miscellaneum of Cinder. I just wanted to see if I could produce a whole booklet on my own. I had a friend do some of the illustrations and put it together in the format that lulu.com would actually accept the format it was basically just sort of a test of is that a thing i could do the miscellaneums of cinder is just a collection it's a little purple booklet of random charts some of which i had used and some of which i wrote specifically for that product and uh, i it's not available for sale right now but i've been working with a publisher to put out a second edition of it sometime in the near future so is that is that the reason that the first one is not available you just, you just pulled it because you're working on a revision uh no uh it's more kind of neglect lulu changed some terms or something and i failed to tell them it's a-okay and so they pulled it from the store and i haven't been able to sort out what exactly i would need to do for that to reappear um actually could Jeff self-publish a game product was what I was trying to find out. Not so much as I'm trying to set the game world alight with yet another book of random tables. Well, except that, you know, there are so many people who like your um, uh, idiosyncratic private space and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, would want to see that. I think in a, you should really work on getting that back into yeah. circulation. I mean, it's pretty easy if you still got the PDF file to put it up on yeah. now, for example. I mean, one bookshelf is very, okay, their interface sucks, but <laughs> once you actually manage to get something on there, as long as you're not doing print on demand, which is a real pain with them because of this, just the technical specifications and everything. But if you're just putting up a, a PDF, uh, you know, that's not hard and it would let people, you know, you're, you've got, you know, lots and lots and lots of fans out there. You know, I kid you not. Yeah. I mean, you've got a huge fan base. Well, the PDF is sort of in, I would, I would say illicit circulation, but you know, uh, if you came across a copy of it, I, it's no skin off of my back if you kept a copy of it. So, um, you know, I wouldn't call it it's been pirated, but, you know, it's been passed around a little bit, and that's perfectly okay for me. Back when it was available for, for Lulu, the download version, I think, made the eight cents a copy. I'm not going to miss that money, <laughs> you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it will reappear in an actually an expanded version with some new material, so... All right. Well, that's something that's something to look forward to. I mean, I wasn't so much uh, yeah. thinking about the the money because I mean, you get into RPG publishing, you know, and you can make, you know, you can become a, a hundred year um, from doing it. <laughs> yes. But uh, what I was thinking about was more the availability. Um, yes. At the very beginning, and I, you know, it's probably worth pointing out, you know, since Jeff and I come really from the beginning of the of, of the re birth of interest in the older game systems that at the beginning of that um, it was a very non-commercial um, atmosphere and community and um, so that you know sort of affected a, a lot of things before companies began forming mm -hmm. and, yeah there was a very much a sort of amateur do it yourself pass it around uh, seen and there still is there's still a lot of people doing a lot of great material for for free it's just a matter of do you want it to be as slick and polished as game companies do you kind of need a game company of some sort to make that happen even yeah, if it's just you know, on, that, that's true on the um, I'm forgetting the word, but the uh, the production values on the thing. Yeah. I, think, I think the other thing about free stuff is generally that it just, um, you know, by its nature tends to come in smaller bites. I mean, the other thing that a publisher has is more, uh, more stamina, um, yeah. you know, for putting together something that's a little bigger and more comprehensive. You get a lot of uh, small maps uh, out there or bigger maps, you know, if, depending on mm -hmm. who you're talking about, or you get 
um, you know, something that's about article length on something, you know, an NPC class, a monster, something like that. And so you'd have to uh, uh, assemble a lot in order to have a, a, any sort of a large resource to look at. And then, of course, it wouldn't fit together at all like a jigsaw puzzle. But I really enjoy the DIY community for the old yes. school. And I, I actually like that sort of act of self-assembly. There's very few products out there that I just want to run wholesale anymore. Uh, maybe when I was younger and, you know, oh, World of Greyhound box set. Yay, let's go and play this for the next 10 years. Uh, you know, I had that sort of reaction to some great game products. More and more, it's just like, uh, I'll steal this one level and put it in my next dungeon is sort of my approach to a lot of products. And I have a lot of difficulty doing that with a commercial product. I don't know. I think that's probably just a, a quirk of mine, but I, I just feel bad somehow taking one level out. It's almost, you know, and, 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 and putting the stuff together. I almost need to go, go whole hog on it and just, you know, get mm. old net books from the 90s and, you know, the little stuff that's out there <laughs> uh, and put, put it together really from the, the very raw material. I, I, don't, I have no idea why I can't do that. The only thing I can do it with is the top level of Quasquaton, um, B1 in Search of the Unknown. For some reason, mm. I really... I love the top level. I got no interest in the in the, in the second level now. I'm totally with you on that. The, the second level just the one part I like is the is the pool of water you can drop the players in. Other than that, the the second level just doesn't do that much for me. Uh, I love the room full of the uh, the pits that maybe are acid and maybe are not. Um, That's the pool. Those are the, the, yeah. the they're like. Uh, the pools in that in that great big room that has lots of yes, and there's a there's a great uh, uh, is it Sutherland illustration of ex uh, investigating those. I, I think yeah, mentioned. oh, it's all it's it's all um, Sutherland, and that is um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I point to when people are like, oh, Dave Sutherland's not much of an artist. I'm like, look, Sutherland doesn't ha you know he doesn't have the technique you know, of somebody mm -hmm. like Trampier, but he really captures the sort of adventuring uh, spirit, especially I think of low level characters. Yes, I totally agree. And uh, his sequence in the bottom margin in the back end of the Dungeon Master's Guide is, is I think, great. masterful. Yeah. So we mentioned commercial products and what I published. I've got to take a moment to plug Broodmother Sky Fortress, uh, given any opportunity to do so. I'm even going to hold my copy up to the camera. So uh, this is uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Uh, Jim Raggi published this. This is my newest thing. It came out about a year ago, and I'm very proud of it. And the work that people did to make my words look good, the the maps, the layout, the illustrations, the team that came together and turned what I wrote into something that looks like a proper game product just blows me away, and I'm quite proud of the results. It, it's one half of it is uh, an adventure that's designed to teach a game master here's a way to approach running an adventure as an old school method. So it's it's not definitive, but it's more like here's my thought process when I pick up a module. What do I think about in order to make this work at my table? I walk the reader step by step through it, and I think it does a pretty good job. The reviews have been pretty positive, and then the back half's mostly here's some of the best bits from my blog. So. Uh, if you've read my blog, you've probably encountered one or more of these, but, you know, as I mentioned, I've got 3,500 posts. Finding the one that you want where I talk about, you know, experience points or something like that isn't super easy anymore because Blogspot just doesn't have a great interface for navigating that sort of stuff. Here's a way to get some of the good posts from my blog, you know. Here's 20 good posts out of the 3,500 I've read. Uh and I, I, I think it turned out very nicely. And that one is for sale through Jim Raggi's uh, website? Yeah. Okay, so yes. um, that's going to be Lamentations of the Flame Princess. I do not know the um, uh, the web handle for the store, but if you want, I'll, tr I'll try and remember to put it in the uh, description underneath yeah. the video. And if I forget to do that, all that you have to do is Google Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Yeah. Because, 
uh, and then you'll get to the to, to Jim Radju's yeah. store. No, Noble Knight also has it, and it is in distro. So if you wanted to go and pester your local game shop to get it, they can get it for you. Okay, so um, so those are different ways um, to get it and to see it. And um, man, I had something that was a really good question or comment or something like that, and I totally lost it. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Let's step back to when you were talking about the introduction where you were talking about how to run a game in an old school style. Yeah. Many people have written things like that, including, um, including me, obviously. Yes. The, the uh, quick primer for old school gaming. And yes, yes. One of, one of the things, and many, many people have written these, and one of the things that fascinates me is it, it proves, really, that the old school community is not at all monolithic because you can get these guides from different people and they've all got um, fairly different advice a lot of the time. So give us some of, um, some of what you think it is uh, in terms of the advice you gave people for running that adventure. Okay. So uh, for me, one of the biggest points of advice I give in that adventure is the sky fortress is a cloud with a fortress on top that's inhabited by monsters. And so the first thing the players have to do if they want to go on this adventure is get up to a cloud. And my advice for the game master is don't sweat it. Make the players sweat it. Let them figure out how they're going to do that. It, it does mean that the players could at some point say, uh, this is too big of a hassle. We've tried catapults and we missed the cloud. We tried learning how to ride pterodactyls and you know, we lost three PCs learning how to ride them. You know, <laughs> you know, at some point they may say, fuck it, we're not going on this adventure. And you know what? That's okay. I mean, okay, you've, been, you've bought an adventure and you're not going to use it. Uh, I've been there before. I've got a stack of adventures that I haven't used. It's, it's you know, economically maybe not the best result from buying an adventure. But if they want it bad enough, they'll figure out a way up there. And if they don't want it bad enough, they'll go on a different adventure. And that's part of respecting the agency of the players. And I think that's important in an old school game. I think I think yeah, right. it's not it's not precisely a sandbox, but people use the word sandbox to describe it a lot of the time, and I think that's you know mm -hmm. really accurate. And the other thing that a lot of people you know don't realize is players will go back to places that they couldn't get into always because it eats at them. Yes, yes, and you can see that a lot in mega dungeon play. I do a lot of funhouse style mega dungeon play that's the heart of my current campaign yes yes good for you that's you know the, you. the brotherhood <laughs> and and not letting the players have a thing for whatever reason everybody blows their open doors roll on a single door that will drive the whole party nuts yeah you know? that's how that's how you get battering rams brought into into dungeons yeah yeah. So simple things like they know there's something they don't. They weren't able to get to it on a previous expedition. You know, I had players that that have organized a whole expedition around, you know, that that one area of the map that we can't visualize right now. We've drawn a bunch of corridors around it. It's clearly, there's something on that blank spot of the map. Yeah, you know. no, I've 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 seen that too. Blank blank spots on maps are a lot of fun. That's one of the reasons, again, why I like um, uh, the model of Quasquaton in B one is that if you have those closely packed corridors, uh, mapping can reveal the fact that there's an area uh, that you haven't gotten into. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think Jeff that um, we're reaching. Uh, roughly the time where we want to uh, cut off the video just based on attention span and so on and so forth. Um, so um, now, and once I stop the broadcast, you and I will still be on here so we can okay. uh, do a chat after that, but go ahead and uh, uh, say goodbye to your fans. Hey, goodbye everybody. Thanks for watching. 
and I will say goodbye to mine and remind everybody, no matter what kind of Dungeons and Dragons it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it. Nice.